I suppose I would start by agreeing that a great part of this debate turns on how a lot of the issues are framed. It is, a, in many ways, a debate over a variety of words, words like political correctness, like multiculturalism, like diversity, and what these things actually mean. And so I want to, instead of talking about political correctness in my opening, I'd like to just say a few things about multiculturalism and diversity. And I think um, the most critical point I want to make to you today is that these are euphemisms. Multicultural, let's start with multiculturalism. Multiculturalism has next to nothing to do with the study of other cultures. I will repeat it. If there's a single thing I'd like you to take with you today, it is that multiculturalism has next to nothing to do with the study of other cultures. It is, that may be a worthwhile thing to do in an increasingly global world, but that's not what it is about. You do not see students protesting on college campuses, demanding um, missionary postings in third world countries to learn more about other societies. You do not have protests demanding more rigorous foreign language requirements. Uh, where people will protest uh, to learn Chinese or Swahili or Russian or anything of that sort. Again, it has nothing to do with other cultures. The same, I think, is true of diversity. This is another one of these incredibly misleading euphemistic terms. It does not, to put it charitably, have much to do with a diversity of ideas. You do not have real diversity on a college campus when you have a campus full of people who look different but think alike. And again, I, I, I I think this is very, very important as a starting point in framing the issue. Well, the question then becomes, well, what are these things really about? What is multiculturalism really about? And I will suggest to you that the single most important theme that runs through much that goes under the rubric of multicultural is that it is anti-Western. It is not non-Western. It is still focused very much on our own society, but it is primarily a vehicle for denouncing it. Uh, at Stanford University, which is the one I'm the most familiar with, but I think is certainly no exception to the rule, uh, the debate over multiculturalism in the late 80s started with a protest. The protest was against Western culture. The notorious chant was, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western culture's got to go. It was not a demand for inclusion. It was a demand for exclusion. Now, why does Western culture have to go? What is the problem with multiculturalism? And what problem does it have? The basic problem, the basic claim is the West is uniquely bad because it is racist, it is sexist, it is oppressive in a variety of other ways. Um, and not only is it, does it have all these problems, but it has them in a way that is far worse than other societies. That's where I think things get very, very problematic. The uh, multicultural educator at Stanford University liked to go around saying, I started looking for racism everywhere and I started finding racism everywhere. And indeed, he did. If you, if you start looking for anything everywhere, you will start finding it everywhere. If you are a feminist, and if you believe that everything is, that is longer than it is wide is a symbol of male oppression, then you will start finding sexism everywhere. If you, if you, want, to, um, if you want to find baseball everywhere, you can find baseball everywhere. And similarly, he could find racism everywhere. Let me just give you a couple of examples of how this process played out. Uh, there was an ongoing debate over boycotting table grapes. Why, what, and that, the fact that table grapes were served in student residences was viewed as evidence of racism. Why? Well, because most of the grape pickers in California happened to be Latino farm workers and they were exposed to dangerous pesticides, supposedly. Now, the fact that a grape boycott would get rid of their jobs was sort of irrelevant because, uh, again, many of these things involve more moral posturing than real substantive concerns over these issues. There was similarly a debate over, over what students are politically correct, politically incorrect. And again, if we want to talk about examples of political correctness, the uh, Black Student Union at Stanford for a number of years maintained something called a blacklist of students that were insufficiently black, uh, of black students who were insufficiently black, which meant that they did not have the ideological views that multiculturalism claims all blacks must hold. It, multiculturalism does not have to do with biology, it has to do with ideology. And the ideology across the board is this far left ideology. Now, I'll tell you what the problem is with looking for racism everywhere. Because when you start looking for racism everywhere and you start finding racism everywhere, it's only a very small step to finding racists everywhere. Now, there's nothing wrong with that if those racists are really out there. 
but I'm going to suggest to you that they really aren't. The problems of racism, sexism, other forms of oppression have been vastly exaggerated, and as a result, people get unjustly accused. A culture of complaint leads to a culture of blame, and that is ultimately the real problem with it. Um, let me just make one last comment, then we'll go on uh, from here. The, the other point that, and along these lines, let me suggest to you that multiculturalism and political correctness must be thought of as different sides of the same coin. The multicultural side is a side where we look for the victims. The politically correct side is the side where we go after the victimizers. The two are inextricably interconnected. You are not going, and that is why you will find the people who are the most multicultural are also the most politically correct. I, I mean, I obviously agree with it on this level of abstraction. You know, we do want to have controversy. We do want to have a thoughtful discussion about many different issues. And I suppose, you know, John, you're right. You know, probably in the late 19th century, um, accounts of Western history were somewhat unduly rosy. People were somewhat, somewhat ridiculously self-congratulatory, and I think that was that was a mistake. I do think things have gone way too far in the other direction today, where we have this sort of scorched earth strategy being waged against our own society. And I think I think we have to find some sort of balance between the two. Now, I, I, it's always difficult to know exactly where you draw the balance, but I'd suggest to you one indicator. And I think one very important salient feature is, of course, that this whole multicultural debate over looking at racism, sexism, other forms of oppression is something that could only take place within the context of Western civilization, within the context of the civilization where individual rights, individual human rights became possible. And multiculturalists go too far when they forget that the very rhetoric that animates their debate is the rhetoric of the West. And they always forget this. They always forget it. So I do think they go too far, at least in that one extremely salient regard. Now, again, there's a question of emphasis. How far does it really go in practice? I will suggest to you that the reason the chant, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western culture's got to go, was so powerful was because it actually referred to two different things. It referred to a class, and it referred to the culture that was being studied in the class. It incredibly succinctly encapsulated what people in higher education had been saying for quite a long time and the tenor with which they had been saying it. Um, you said a few other things about speech codes. This is sort of the, the, the bigger problem, is that on a lot of these college campuses we have speech codes where people feel they cannot debate topics and so on. And it is true that these speech codes are often not very rigorously enforced. They're not very precise. They are, in fact, it's often very unclear what you can say and what you cannot say. But I will suggest to you they have a tremendous stifling effect nonetheless, because the way these speech codes work in practice is that you as a student will err on the side of silence. They are incredibly inhibiting of controversial discourse. The point of the Keith Raboy episode, just to, to sort of provide the details that uh, John omitted, was that uh, it was sort of a, uh, Keith was perhaps this was the wrong thing to do, but it, he attempted to create a test case of the speech code. And his speech did not, strictly speaking, fall out. It was, strictly speaking, still protected under the speech code at Stanford. But at the same time, the point is there are very few people who say things like Keith, who feel free to say those things, or who would say those things if they were not trying to create a test case. There is no problem of racist speech on campus. There is no problem with racism. There is no problem with sexism. These, or to the extent there is a problem, it is not very big. One of the reasons multiculturalism was able to get off the ground in the first place is that most college-age students, and especially those who are attending our top universities, are not bigots. There are very few who are. And so I think one of the really big problems we have to come to grips with is this sense in which the reason we have racial tensions in our society, the reason we have other kinds of tensions, is not because there is a problem with racism and other forms of oppression, but because people are looking for these things too much. If you are dealing with a multicultural educator who is looking for racism everywhere and who's finding racism everywhere, then I think one of the things you might do is you might just stay clear of that person. Because whatever you're going to say, if you ask them about racism, well, that's evidence of racism. If you don't ask them about it, racism, that's evidence that you're not interested and that you're racist. It's, it's a, it's a no-win, you-lose situation. You will stay totally clear of that whole debate. And so I will suggest to you one of the reasons we do have some tensions between different groups of people in our society is, in fact, precisely because the focus on these issues has become so misplaced. In many ways, the cure is worse than the disease at this point.
Um, John uh, also said some very interesting things about sort of his examples of conservative correctness. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and defend everything that everyone who's conservative or claims to be conservative has said or done in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, but I will suggest that the scope of the problem is primarily a problem of the left. And this is simply numerically the case. If you look at the breakdown of people who are teaching in higher education, most of them are liberal. Most of them are on the far left end of the political spectrum. Again, Stanford's very representative in this regard. Um, in the humanities departments, uh, by political party affiliation, you had about 80% plus Democrats, 10% independents, and fewer than 10% Republicans. And that understates the ideological bias because the Republicans tend to be middle of the road Republicans. The Democrats tend to be very far to the left of the Democratic Party. There are there is an interesting theoretical question. If conservatives controlled these institutions of education, would they behave any better than the liberals are now behaving? I do not know the answer to that. But that's not what we're debating today. We're debating what's actually happening. And what's actually the case is, of course, that the problem is primarily one on the left, primarily because uh, most of the people are, in fact, liberals. And you have to go to some very small, exceptional colleges to find a different pattern. I, I personally would say that. Uh, a religious school is in a somewhat different category, that a religious school can impose standards. It can say, we are not going to have someone who is pro-choice teaching in a Catholic university. If th that would seem to me to be a, a matter that is totally up to the private university. However, and again, this debate is primarily about what's happening at the leading large universities, the major public universities, and some of the leading private universities. And they do not advertise themselves as liberal institutions. They advertise themselves as open-minded, diverse institutions. And so I would suggest to you, I would be quite happy if we just had some truth in advertising. If we are going to be enforcing a liberal orthodoxy, then let us say so. And if you are willing to say so, and you have a private university that receives no government funding or virtually no government funding, you have a right to do that. But you should not go around suggesting you're inclusive and open-minded when that is one of the furthest things from the truth. Finally, let me make one other comment on sort of the, these, this question about all these politically correct anecdotes, whether these anecdotes are true or false, whether Lynn Cheney got her details wrong on page 200-something, and so on. I am sure that some of the anecdotes may have been exaggerated in the retelling. That's quite conceivable. But I will suggest to you, John, that this latest politically correct line, there's no such thing as political correctness, is ultimately just not going to wash. And the reason it's not going to wash is not because there are lots and lots of different anecdotes and I'm going to overwhelm you with dozens of them. Although, you know, I could spend the next three hours telling you one anecdote after another, like the blacklist, like the great boycott, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. But the reason it's not going to wash is that the reason people believe these anecdotes is not because there is a conservative, heterosexual, white male conspiracy to spread these anecdotes. It is because most people in their day-to-day -day lives have experienced something like it. Maybe not quite as bad as what happened to, say, a cafeteria worker at Stanford who still served grapes and was pelted with them one day. They were a little bit behind the times. Or perhaps not quite as bad as the students who made the blacklist and were shunned for their four years as an undergraduate education. But people have experienced things that are close enough to this. And that is why I think we see a very broad coalition against political correctness. It's not just conservatives. It is also a lot of liberals, um, say, um, say liberals who may be pro-life on an issue, people who do not necessarily fit a well-defined ideological box. They get, they get hammered on those issues. They get hammered on other issues. And uh, that's why a lot of people are saying enough is enough. In putting together the diversity myth, one of the, one of the interesting things my co-author and I found was that we got some of the most enthusiastic support from people who were, would be considered on the liberal or moderate end of the political spectrum. They are often the ones who are in academia. They're the traditional academics who tend to be politically quite liberal, but who don't necessarily want to follow this hard left party line. And uh, they have simply had it. And that's why there is this debate about political correctness, and that's why uh, we're going to have to do something about the problem. Thank you. It's, it's, again, it's always difficult to quantify these things, to know exactly what's, what's going on. One, I think, really interesting 
gauge of sort of the tenor of what's happening on college campuses. If you look at the commencement speakers at these college campuses, if you look at the hundred top colleges as ranked by U.S. News and World Report, um, uh, Young America's Foundation did a survey on this, and they found that last year only a single college had someone who could be considered conservative. It was, uh, I don't remember the college, it was, I believe, Congressman Dan Livingston from Louisiana, sort of a moderate to conservative type Republican, was at one college. Um, that was the only one out of 100 who was conservative. Not, not all of them were political, but you had a lot of people who were then the full spectrum further to the left. There is a huge skewing. And I want to suggest to you that a large part of the reason this, we have this problem of political correctness is, of course, John's right about this too, is that political correctness has not been defined by the people who are politically correct. It's been defined by the victims of political correctness. And the people who are politically correct, the people who are on these college campuses, do not see themselves as leftists or liberals. They might see themselves as quite moderate. And, you know, if you are a supporter of Jesse Jackson, you might be right in the middle of your college campus community. You might be a moderate. But you're not a moderate for the rest of the country. And that's why there is this incredible skewing. And I think this whole debate is, in a sense, symptomatic of a profound disconnect between what's happening in academia and what is happening in the rest of America. The kinds of debates we're having in DC right now, in many other places in this country about some of the fundamental problems we have in our society are not being held on college campuses. And I think that's too bad because there is much that could be contributed there. And, uh, and I think, uh, unfortunately, much of the focus on this multicultural agenda has served as a sort of substitute for discussion of more important, more serious topics, a meltdown in our education system, the cultural meltdown in America, the economic uh, stagnation in our society, all those kinds of problems are not ones you will talk about when you spend all of your time looking for racism everywhere. Thank you very much. It's, they're not uniformly culturally relativist, because when it comes to Western society, they are never relativist. Western society is always worse. You're culturally relative when you're dealing with other societies and when you want to excuse them. And so you have to be a little bit skeptical about the cultural relativism argument because what I think is really going on in practice is we use cultural relativism so we don't need to question other societies and so we can use them as vehicles to beat up on our own. All these things are, these statistics are all open to some interpretation, although I think this is an absolutely incredible indicator that, uh, again, to take Stanford as an example, you have about 250 people majoring in economics, about one-sixth of the undergraduates. You have four or five a year majoring in, in feminist studies or gender studies. I guess gender studies is politically correct. Feminist studies is politically incorrect. I got a five-minute lecture on that once. Um, but, uh, and, and you have more classes in gender studies than you have in economics. Now, I suppose there are lots of interpretations. The one thing I would like to suggest to you uh, is that this phenomenon is not being driven by, by, a, by demand by radical students. That certainly is one characterization. I think it's primarily a supply side problem. It's a problem that we have this oversupply of left-wing faculty who want to teach feminist studies classes. And the way they teach them when people don't want to take them is they institute graduation requirements. At Stanford, they instituted a graduation requirement in gender studies a couple of years ago. Only about, they took polls of the students. Only about 30% of the students even wanted to take it. I'm not sure that's always the best indicator, but it was not being driven by student demand. It's being driven, it's a supply side problem. Basically, the radicals of the, of the 60s got their PhDs in the 70s. They were associate professors in the 80s, and they have tenure in the 90s, and it's going to be with us for quite a while. I, I've said that I think one of the cures for multiculturalism, for the sort of fictitious multiculturalism that we have taking place today is some real multiculturalism, is some genuine study of other cultures. Uh, you know, one of my, one of my friends was, um, was in Egypt for a couple of years and, and, and told me that, that you had a number of um, African-American students coming to Egypt uh, to study because they've been told this was where their roots were and so on from the Afrocentric mythology. And one of the things they experienced there was racism far worse than anything they had ever experienced in the U.S. And it was a real eye-opener to them. And I think that as we actually implement some of the multicultural rhetoric and really start to learn about other cultures, um, the whole system is going to collapse because it's just, it's just so totally false. I guess part of the problem is that once you start recognizing all these various group rights and group responsibilities and so on, there really is not very much space for the individual left. And I think this is the problem with this rampant politicization is that, you know, when you have multiculturalism debated in bathroom stall cartoons, which was the case at Stanford, when you have it, when you have a stuff being pushed every single place, every single avenue, there is no space for the individual left. The needs of the collective trump the rights of the individual. Um,
and I'll just I'll leave it at that. That's the.